how you can make the Word of God flesh to you. have been teaching on a message or series, Trust Jesus. And I do believe that really if every believer can do just that, it will be well with us to just trust Jesus. And so we covered trust Jesus because he is our righteousness uh, in the series that is. And we said trust Jesus because he is the apostle and the high priest of our confession. We said trust Jesus because he is our shepherd. Uh, we taught on trust Jesus because he's given us his spirit. So we covered these grounds uh, in the last two months. And today, we're going to talk about trust Jesus. He is our healer. Trust Jesus. He is our healer. Now, uh, before we go any further, I want to lay this uh, foundation for this teaching on why it is that we need to trust someone anyway. Um, trust is simply a decision that one makes to rely or depend on another. So trust is a decision. It's a decision that one makes to depend or rely on another. It's not something that just happens. You have to go through the process of making a decision to really come to the place of depending or relying on someone. And usually when you do that, when you go through that process, you're doing it because you want to make sure that that individual that you have decided to trust is someone that is reliable or dependable or someone that has credibility or someone that has the ability or the power to be able to do what you are hoping they could do for you. You understand what I'm saying? So we don't throw trust out just like that. For example, it's very difficult to trust a baby or to trust a child or to trust someone who doesn't have the necessary experience or the power to support the trust that you might have in them. And so when you say you trust someone, <clears throat> it's a decision that one makes to rely or depend upon that person. If you understand, I say amen. And so when we say we trust Jesus, what we are saying is, is that we have made a decision, a decision of quality, a decision of a rigorous analysis in the heart that there's no one that can do us like Jesus does us. And therefore, we can depend upon him or rely on him. And so that's why we're doing this series on trust Jesus, he is this, trust Jesus, he is that. And this morning, I want to talk to you about trust Jesus. He is our healer. And with that, I want you to come with me to the book of Colossians. I'm going to read a lot from the Message Bible. And so you may have to look on the screen a lot with me. And let's go to the Message Bible, chapter 1. And we're going to start with verse 19. And Colossians chapter 1 in the Message Bible, verse 19, and we're going to read through verse 23. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. This is Jesus now. That everything of God finds its proper place, and healing is one of the uh, the, the things of God that finds its proper place in him without crowding. Verse 20. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe. 
when your body is broken, dislocated, it's all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. Praise the Lord. Every person with any dislocation, brokenness in them, both emotionally as well as physically, that person will find their proper place fit together in Christ Jesus without any crowding whatsoever. Verse 21, you yourselves are a case study of what he does. <laughs> you are a case study. You know what a case study is? All right, praise the Lord. At one time, you all had our, your backs turned to God. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, including yours truly, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. Verse 22. <laughs> but now, say but now. but now. Oh, praise the Lord for now. Say but now. By giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you. That's what Minister Hank was, you know, prompted by the Holy Ghost. to. He didn't know I was going to go there this morning, but he, the Holy Spirit was using him as John the Baptist to prepare the, 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 for that, for that. So, but now by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side. Oh, my God. Christ, Jesus Christ, brought you over to God's side and put your lives together whole and holy in his presence. <clears throat> now, this is where trust comes in. You have to trust what you just read there. Now, another way to say trust is believe. You have to believe what we just read there. Now, you believe in the one that you believe. When you believe, you are not believing. It is not the believer who believes in the believer. When you believe, you believe in the one believed. I hope, let me say it again. When you believe, you are not believing in the believer. You are the believer. I am the believer. I'm not believing in myself. When I believe, I'm believing in the one that I believe. That's what I started saying about trust, that it is a conscious decision that you make to rely and depend upon someone's ability to take care of you so that you can rely and depend upon them. Hello? And so when we make a decision of trust or of faith or belief, we're not believing in ourselves. We are believing in the one in whom we have believed. If you understand, I say amen. amen. Let's go to verse 23. It says, you don't walk away from a gift like that. Hello? Amen. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust. You see that? Constantly turn, tune in to the message. Constantly. That's why you come to church. That's why you come to Bible study. That's why you read the Bible. Amen. You see, because you want to constantly be tuned into the message. Amen. The message that you trust in the one who is capable of holding that trust that you trust in them and to provide you what they have promised to you. It says they constantly tune into the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. You have to be careful not to be distracted or diverted. There's no other message, just this one. There's no other message, just this one. There's no other message, just this one. Praise the Lord. Just this one. This one of grace, praise the Lord. This one of mercy, praise the Lord. This one of Jesus, praise the Lord. There's no other message, just this one. Every creature on the heaven gets this same message. So I, Paul, I'm a messenger of this message. I, Alexander Arthur, I am a messenger of this message. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> now, I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 5. 
again, going through the message Bible. I'm trying to help you build the foundation of trust as we move towards uh, the, this teaching of healing. Romans chapter 5 in the Message Bible, we're going to read verses 5 through 10. Romans 5, verses 5 through 10. It says, Now let expectancy such as this, we are never left feeling short change. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers <laughs> to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Think about it. We can't round up enough containers. Remember the story in the Bible about a woman that the, the prophet told her to go collect some containers of vessels. And then as they poured the oil in those vessels, at a certain point there were no containers, no more vessels. So what happened? The Bible said the oil stayed. The Bible is telling us here that, that we in ourselves, we don't have enough containers to hold everything that God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit, which is why we have to expand our capacity to hold more. Whilst you're sitting here, hearing this message, listening to this message, your spirit is breaking up, I mean, is expanding, I should say, expanding so that you can contain more of what God wants you to have. What does that mean? It means that you will get a revelation today of what God has done for you. And through this revelation, you'll be able to receive more from him. This word of God is forever pregnant. This word of God is forever increasing and expanding. And he wants you to have a revelation of that so that every day that you stay tuned to the message, the only message that you are, is worth listening to, the message of grace, that that message will continue to open the door for you to receive what God wants to put in your container. Your container is your spirit. Yes. Verse 6. Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. <laughs> he presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. That means you couldn't save yourself. There's nothing that you could have been able to do uh, if, you were, <laughs> if you knew even how to do it for you to save yourself. Nobody could. Nobody can. Only God can save us. And for that to happen, it was necessary, it was important that indeed Jesus came in at the right time to take care of us because we couldn't take care of ourselves. We were weak. We were rebellious. The Bible says in the King James that uh, we were all ungodly and we were in sin. And Jesus arrived at the right time. Oh, my God in me. He arrived at the right time for us. Praise the Lord. Verse 7. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for. And we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice. Verse 8. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatever to him. My God in me. What we're trying to get you to see this morning is why we trust Jesus. The price that he paid for us. What he did for us so that when we start talking about healing, you can know that indeed the healing has already been completed, finished as a work of the Lord, all you have to do is to receive it. Amen. Just like you have to receive Jesus as a Lord and Savior, you have to receive healing just like that. Amen. And you receive it not based upon how capable you think you are or how holy you think you are or how obedient you think you have been. It's all about the one who has made a promise to you and done the work for you. Praise the Lord. Amen. You don't believe in yourself. You believe in the one that you believe. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 9. Now that we are set right with God by means of this sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there is no longer a question 
of being at odds with God in any way. So that's what sometimes makes people not able to receive healing. They think that they are at odds with God because of something that they did. The Bible is saying to us that there's no longer a question, no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. If, there's, if you are no longer at odds with God in any way, then why even can you possibly imagine yourself unable to receive this gift of healing? If, if you are not, if God is not angry with you, if God is not irritated or annoyed with you, if the price has been paid for you to receive everything that he has for you, why is it at all that you think that there's something that is, you know, that you are at odds with God in any way? The Bible says there's no way. There's nothing between you and God now. And if that is the case, it means that you can receive whatever God has for you. Amen. Satan will make you think that, oh, because of something that you did, this is why you can't get healed. Something that you had done or are doing is the reason why you're still sick. Let me tell you the reason. Do you know when Jesus was here? Look at what the scripture says in, in, in um, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts 10, 38. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. I love that. <laughs> ready for action. Are you ready for action? Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's why you tell your spouse on your anniversary. Day. Are you ready for action? There are no children here, so I can say that. All right. They? No, they're not. They're not. No. All right. Uh, and so, so then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, another by God, with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. He went through the country helping people and healing everyone. Healing everyone. Healing everyone. Heal, say that with me. Healing everyone. Say that again. Healing everyone. One more time. Healing everyone. Say, I am everyone. I am one of the everyone. Praise the Lord. So Jesus went through the country helping people and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil who was able to do all this because God was with him. This is the point. Jesus never stopped to ask the people that he healed, did you commit fornication or adultery? Did you cheat somebody? Did you gossip about someone? He didn't do any of that. All he did was is that if you came to receive that's what, in fact, the Bible says this is the reason why prostitutes and sinners loved him so much. Because somebody said this, the best qualification for a Christian, or I mean for anyone to be a Christian, is not to have any qualification. <laughs> the best qualification is not to have any qualification. Because Jesus takes care of the unqualified ones. Hello. Because the world wants you to think that you have to qualify before you can get this or before you can honor the law of Moses, you have to qualify. Under the law of grace or under the, the, the gospel of grace, there is no qualification. Just come as you are. The degree to which you can believe him for it. That's all it is. It's all about whether you can believe God or not, whether you can believe Jesus or not. That's all it is. And that's what we have to teach on how to believe. Because if you're able to believe, all things are possible. Praise the Lord. Somebody said impossible is nothing. You know, they used to have commercials on that. But anyway, let's go back to Romans chapter 5 now. And we'll stop at verse 9. Okay. Now that we are set right with God. Oh, I love this. Are you set right with God now? Yes. You are set right because you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so you are now set right with God. By means of this sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there's no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. Verse 10. If when we were at our worst... 
we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of a son. Now that we are at our best, just think of how our lives will expand and deepen by means of his resurrection life. If I understand, I say amen. amen. When we were at worst, we were put on friendly terms with God. Now we are at our best. And you might say, no, how can you say that I'm at my best if you only knew what I had done or what I did? God says you are at your best now. Because he, when he comes to live on the inside of you, you are now at your best. And if you're at your worst, his son died for you when you were at your worst. How much more now that he has resurrected and you are at your best, that he wouldn't do everything else for you. And healing is one of those things. Oh, praise the Lord. Let's go to another place. This may be two more verses of scripture and then we will get into the teaching that I have on healing. Because I want to really get this point across. Go with me to Psalms 91, verses 10 through 11. Are you getting something from this? Okay, praise the Lord. So evil can get close to you. Think about it. Now that you are at your best, evil can get close to you. <laughs> you might say, well, my co-worker is an evil person. Well, <laughs> They still can't get close to you. Because the you is your spirit. And if they can't get close to your spirit, they can't get you. I think the problem we have is that we allow our feelings to determine whether what God has said is true or not. If you do that, you'll miss it. Don't ever allow your feelings to, to determine truth for you. When your feelings put the focus on yourself, believing puts the focus on Jesus. You say, I may feel this way, I may feel that way. You put the focus on yourself. I believe this, I believe that. You put the believing or the focus on the one that you believe. If you understand, I say amen. amen. If it can't get close to you, you have to make a choice on that. You read this. And you say, well, can I really believe that? Well, I believe that because I trust the one who said it. Amen. If he says, if we can get close to me, that's what I believe. Amen. Now, he wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. Amen. That's an interesting scripture in the Bible um, that talks about the seed of Isaac will possess the gate of his enemies. This is in reference to Jesus Christ, that he will possess the gate of his enemies. In the, in the Old Testament, in the ancient times, when you possess the gates of any town, it means that you are in control, you are in domination, you are in, the, in authority over that town. And so Jesus was prophesied about him that he will possess the gates of his enemy, and we know the enemy to be Satan. So that's the evil one. And so no evil can get to you because the evil's power has already been taken away from him. Praise the Lord. And the book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says that Jesus spoiled principalities, you know, openly. And made a show of them openly. So Jesus already has taken care of that. So when we read the scripture, evil can get close to you. You have to believe that. You know, sickness is evil because it keeps you from finishing the destiny and the purpose of God in your life. So you have to treat it as an enemy. Hello. And you have to believe that it can get to you even though it might be affecting your body, it can affect your spirit. And your spirit is where the power is. And if you can hold on to what is in your spirit and trust God to have that spiritual power, it, it, it emanate and, 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 and come up on you, it will go into your mind and affect your body. That's what God wants. He wants everything that you ever will want is in your spirit. Everything that you will ever need, 
Your healing is in your spirit. Your wealth is in your spirit. Your peace is in your spirit. Everything is in your spirit. Everything. The key is getting it from the spirit to the body. How do I get what's in my spirit to come up on my body? Because it's, you know, you, we live, and I say this often here, we live in the duality of existence. We live in the spiritual realm, and we live in the physical realm. Amen. And so when we find truth in the spirit, we want to also find truth in the physical. Amen. God does it in the spirit, and then he tells you and I to receive it in the spirit so it can come into the physical. So we are the transmission belt. And it's a question whether you're going to use rubber to transmit electricity, or you're going to use copper. Copper is a good transmitter of electricity. Is that true? Amen. Rubber isn't. Is that true? Yes. And so, do you want to be a rubber, a rubber, or you want to be a copper? The electricity is already there. Is it my accent you are talking about? The <laughs> rubber. I could tell when, the, but anyway, it comes with the territory. All right. <laughs> and so you, no, but you said another thing there. It's good. Okay, thank you. All right. And so you either want to be a rubber or you want to be a copper. And for me, I want to be a copper. And the reason for that is that I want to transmit the power that is in my spirit that God has placed in there into my body. Amen. And the way to transmit it is to believe that it is there and it is capable of being brought into my physical natural realm. Amen. And when I do that, God says, now that you have given me the, uh, the right to intervene, I'm going to come in and take what's in the spirit and put it on your body. Amen. Are you getting this? Amen. Are you getting this? You don't even have to be thinking about you putting it on your body. All God wants is for you to accept that you have it in the spirit. And when you say that, that I believe that I'm healed, you are saying that you are healed because it's in your spirit. And when you say that you are healed and it's in your spirit, now God says, now that you said that, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. You have said it to two witnesses. God's word is a witness. Your word is a witness. And it can be established. The establishing is done by God. Oh, praise the Lord. He might tell you to drink more water. It might be the reason. He might tell you to go and work out. That's a tough thing for some of us. He might t tell you to walk a mile a day. That is God telling you what it would take to establish what is in the spirit into the natural realm. Are you getting me here? And what I'm saying to you this morning, it applies to me as well. All of us have to do it. And sometimes when we preachers are preaching here, it makes you all think that we got it all figured it out. Oh, I will be, it would be so good for me to come and stand here and say, in the name of Jesus, little children, Oh, I've all figured it out. No, I have not. Not at all. We are all in this journey. We are on a pilgrimage. All of us are. And what we have to do, and that's the reason why I make it as important study on my part to be able to get the word out to you that I want to feed on myself. Because my life depends upon it also. It's like the pilot. I don't think any pilot on a plane wants to kill somebody. That's why you can get in the plane and take it away. That guy wants to live as much as I want to live. And so, on, you know, he would do everything to uh, take off, uh, take the, no, take off and land without any problem. Praise the Lord, thank God. And of course, we trust more God than the pilots. But my point is, even in the natural, the pilot wants to live. Amen. I get him here. So if I'm the pilot here, I want to live as well. So I have to study like the pilot has to study. Go through all these other things that you have to learn. So when you stand here and delivering the word, you are delivering it just as good for them as you want for yourself. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. And so I love teaching of the word because it brings 
greater understanding. It brings revelation. It brings impartation. Impartation is taking what is in your spirit and putting it into somebody else's spirit. Preaching is taking what is in your mind and putting it into somebody else's mind. That's inspiration. And everyone wants to know why people need inspiration. But inspiration will not ultimately bring you victory. Now, people are motivated for a short while, and after a while, the rubber meets the road, and they have to come up with something practical or operational to make it work for them. But in the meantime, while they're going through something, they probably needed to hear something else that will help them be sustained, be buoyed, uh, so that they can somehow make it another day. So don't get me wrong, we need preaching and we need teaching as well. All right, where did we stop? Um, we didn't finish, the, uh, yeah, yeah. I say, harm can't get through the door. Harm can't get through the door. And you say to yourself, well, harm has already gotten through the door. Don't forget, we're talking about spiritual things now. So if it has gotten through the door to your body, it hasn't gotten through the door of your spirit. Nothing can go through the door of your spirit. When you get born again, nothing, say nothing, can go through the door of your spirit. Nothing. Because the Holy Spirit is the seal who has sealed the door of your spirit. Nothing bad can ever get in. Only good will come out. Praise the Lord. And the good that is in your spirit, which is healing, will come out. Amen. Praise the Lord. So hold on to this. Go to Philemon, the book of Philemon, chapter 1. I, I look like I'm not going to be done this morning, but we'll have another installment next week. Philemon, chapter 1, verse 6. And this one, go to King James, because I like King James' uh, rendition of it better than, than, uh, than uh, Message Bible. It says that the communication of your faith, communication of what you believe, communication of what you trust, that means speaking of what you trust, speaking of what you believe, speaking of it may become effectual or may become effective or may become operational or may become active by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so the Bible says to you, there's every good thing in you that is in Christ Jesus. Every good thing, every good thing, say every good thing. Every is good healing thing. a good thing? Yes. It's in you, according to the scripture. And so you have to believe it. And if you believe it, you have to communicate it. And the way you communicate it is to say it, like I just told you to say it, and you just did. That every good thing is in you. That is in Christ Jesus. And healing is a good thing. Say this, healing, healing. is a good thing. Good. And healing yeah. is in me. In me. I, carry, I carry, I contain, I contain. Healing, healing in my container which is my spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go to one more verse and then we will... In fact, let's go to this. After this, now I'll give you scriptures on, on healing. Go to Psalm 119. Psalms 119, verse 130. Psalms 119, in the, in the uh, King James, it says, The entrance of your words gives light. The word of God is coming to you. It's going into your spirit. And when it goes there, it brings light to you. You know what light is? It's like saying revelation to you. What it means is that, that when the word of God gets into you, something is turned on on the inside of you. And revelation is, is so important for a spirit being. When you are a spirit, revelation is important. Because when you gain revelation, for example, how many of you here are born again? That is everybody here. So I guess there will be no invitation. Everybody's here is born again. But that's good. Thank God for that. Praise the Lord. Now, let us say that somebody stood here 
this morning and says to you that God is telling you that you are not born again. And the reason for that is that you were not baptized in the name of Jesus only. Or that the reason for that that you have not been baptized. Or the reason for that is that you don't worship on Saturday. Do you know how that person may sound to you? Or the reason being that you don't attend the really true church that is given, the name given in the Bible. Now, people preach that, you know. I'll never forget a time when I ministered to a couple that were threatening divorce. This was before I even became a pastor. This would be 1985. And this person was an apostolic, if you know the apostolic doctrine. They believe in Jesus only. They don't believe in the Trinity. And so, after the Lord blessed to heal their marriage, uh, I began a Bible study. And in fact, at that Bible study, the general will attend uh, at a Bible study in my home, along with uh, Dr. Moore and Jala, and they're not here now. And, and I started teaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what I just taught here last Sunday. And the man who himself was an associate pastor of an apostolic church stood up and said that I was teaching error because I was claiming that the Holy Spirit is a person rather than being a force or power of God. And that person actually got up, picked up his Bible, and left the Bible study, saying that I was not saved. Now, when they were in trouble, I was saved enough to save. <laughs> but now that they've gotten it together, I'm not saved. All right. And you know, your, your, your pastor is so diplomatic. I just found a way to make it a wonderful evening. Lo and behold, this is an interesting story. Lo and behold, the, the marriage ended in divorce. Lo and behold, the spouse, the, ex, the ex-wife, ended up attending this church. And meeting her next husband in this church. And then, of course, they got married, and then they moved away, and they moved away, and they now divorce. That, that's a, a, a lesson in this message. And the lesson is the importance of hearing the word, sticking to the word, and knowing the truth of the word of God. Because your life may depend upon it in that regard. And the key point here is, is that as I was saying, because I knew that I was saved, as I said, I wasn't even called to pastor then. It didn't bother me that this, he said that I wasn't saved. And the interest is that the guy himself had been here since. Not joined, but been here and attended services here. And so, if you know that you are saved, you get a revelation. And that revelation is so strong in you, nobody can distract you, dissuade you to make you think otherwise. But you got to make sure that you're saved. And it takes revelation to bring that understanding to you that indeed you are born again. Not by anything that you might have done, it is all about what Jesus has done for you. Praise the Lord. So the key point is understanding that indeed, when it comes down to it, it's all about what the finished works of Jesus is, not so much as what you want to do to make it happen. You got to believe that you're carrying healing in you. You got to believe. So when we come and we take the communion, for example, we are not taking it to be well. We are taking it to confirm that we are well. 
Do you know the woman with the issue of blood? This is what was said about her. It said, when she heard about Jesus, what prompted her to leave her house, 12 years hemorrhaging, as a female, she wasn't allowed under the Mosaic law to leave her house to enter into any groups of people for fear that whatever she might have had might contaminate others. But after she heard about Jesus, the Bible said when she heard about Jesus, something happened to her. What happened to her was she began to believe. Amen. How do we know that? In fact, Jesus himself told her, daughter, thy faith had made you whole. Your believing has made you whole. What made you get up from your house and come amongst the crowd and touch the hem of your, my garment was because of you trusting me and believing that I could do what we just read in Acts chapter 10 verse 38, that Jesus was going to the countryside, hello, and healing all that Satan or the devil had attacked and God calling them to be diseased and ill. My point to you this morning is that we also have heard about Jesus. We heard about him as our healer. And the same Jesus, in fact, you might say, well, I wish Jesus was here. Then I could really believe that I can be healed. But the point is, is that Jesus is more of a blessing to you that he's not here. He told the disciples, it is better, it is expedient to you that I go away. Yes, sir. How could he say that as a Messiah, as a Christ, as a, the, 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 um, the uh, leader to tell them it is expedient, it is better for you for me to go away? Who glory. Hallelujah. It is better for me, for you, for me to go away. Because when I go away, I will send to you another comforter. And when the comforter comes, he will show you of all things. He will testify of me and will lead you into all truth. And the benefit of having the comforter, the Holy Spirit, in us now is that he is our teacher. He shows if Jesus were here, he couldn't be in, uh, in Antioch now. He couldn't even be at a gas station, Crooked gas station down the road. Because you'll be physically bound to be in one place. But since he left, he can be with believers here and can be with believers in Africa. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And give them the same revelation that I'm talking about, about them being healed. And so it is expedient. He said, for me, Jesus said, to go away for your benefit. And then he told Thomas, Thomas, it is more blessed for you if anyone, if for them not seeing, but, also, but rather believing. Because sometimes we think that seeing is more important. If I could see it, I can believe it. But it is not that. You haven't seen yourself healed, but you believe yourself healed. Amen. If you believe yourself healed, it is better than seeing yourself healed. Because if you want to see yourself healed first before you believe, Amen. that's what I meant. Amen. Let me explain that. It is better to see yourself healed, believing that you're healed, than, and then see yourself healed, than to start with seeing yourself healed before you can believe that you're healed. Did that confuse you? <laughs> it is better for you to believe that you are healed before you see yourself healed than to see yourself healed first before you can believe that you are healed. Because if you do that, then at all times, you want to see something first before you can believe it. If that is the case, you are no different than somebody who's not born again. But for those of us who are born again, we believe first and we see second. We believe in the spirit that we are healed and we see second in the natural that indeed that we are healed. Praise the Lord. And the fact that we haven't seen it yet doesn't mean that we have not been healed already. Oh, praise the Lord. Let me prove something to you. Go to, and use the King James here, go to the book of um, John chapter 12 verse 47. 
we're almost done here. Go to 45. So he that seeth me, see him that sent me. Verse 46. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. If you believe in Jesus, you will get revelation. You will get light turned on. The entrance of the word bringeth what? Light and simple to the understanding. Uh, understanding to the simple, I should say. And, and, and say, a believer on me should not abide in darkness. Verse 47, okay? And if any man hear my words and believe not, any man hear my words, and be, that means if you hear the words of Jesus, what do you do? If you hear the words of Jesus, what do you do? Believe. believe. Praise the Lord. So if you hear the words of Jesus, what do you do? Believe. Exactly. When you hear the words of Jesus, what do you do? Okay, believe it is the same as trust, right? So I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Verse 48, he that rejects me and receives not my words hath one that judges him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. So you hear the word of Jesus and you reject that, that word. He says, the word that you rejected that will judge that person in that day. Meaning the person, the day when uh, people are being judged, not us, uh, but those who are not born again. Uh, they will remember that somebody came to them and shared the word with them and they turned the person down, unfortunately. Verse 49, I read this to get to this verse here. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should what? Speak. And so it tells me that Jesus spoke what his father gave him to say. Are you getting it? And so everything that Jesus said was what God told him to say. Hmm. Everything that Jesus said was what the father told him to say. What God wants us to also do is to do like Jesus. Everything that we say is what he has said to us to say. If he says, for example, that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and I'm, I'm going to start with this next week, 1 Peter 2, 24. 1 Peter 2, 24, it says this. It says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. And so because Jesus spoke what the Father told him to say, we also must speak or say what the Father tells us to say. So what do we say? We say that we are healed. Amen. Jesus was able to do a lot more miracles because he said what the Father told him to say. Imagine what you would be able to do also if you said what the Father said to you to say. Are you getting me here? All right, let's pick up on this, and uh, we, I, I'm told that my time is done. 